Welcome to panel B of the uh, Camille Diaries Symposium. Camille Diaries Symposium is in connection with the Camille Diaries Exhibition at Art Laboratory Berlin, uh, which opened on August 27th and runs through the 4th of October of this year. And our uh, second panel uh, of the day uh, includes Shmela Petrich, Mary Magic, Laura Benitez Valero, Naya Ankerfeld, and Bauman Leahy. The title, the title of the panel is Fluid Inheritance. And by fluid inheritance, we mean uh, oceans, liquid, horm uh, hormones, biochemistry, biochemistry not just in, uh, in itself, but also as an alternative to genetics, questioning uh, the dominant role of that field. Uh, it's about uh, our liquid and oceanic kin, algae, our watery origins, uh, but also the dark side of the Anthropocene or Cthulhu scene, uh, plastics, uh, uh, microplastics, endocrine disruptors, environmental toxicity, uh, the permeability of our own bodies, queering waters, and what one artist lovingly calls for monsters. We're going to start off uh, with Shbella Petrich. Uh, Spella uh, approaches art production with a background in hybrid arts, as well as a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, these dual and often dueling epistemological approaches inform her work with the plant kingdom as part of a multi-species collaboration, exploring ontologies, methodologies, ethics, and practices of care, uh, involving our relationship to the vegetal, vegetal. Based in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and Amsterdam, Spella's work challenges traditional and established notions uh, and structures in both the sciences and humanities, often uh, upsetting the situational hierarchy, hierarchies uh, knowledge has built, been built upon. Her work in the exhibition is phytoteratology. It's a product of a laborious, months-long process of raising thalecrest clones, whose growth uh, process has been stimulated by hormones from the artist's own body. Though genetically identical to their plant parent, these monsters, as she calls them, uh, uh, lovingly, are very much her biochemical kin. The work implicitly challenges the predominance of genetics in biotechnology, uh, as genetics e are easily abstracted and coded, and the scientific and cultural focus on genetics continues uh, traditions, age-long traditions of patrimony and property, in its place, the artist proposes and analyzes and puts into practice liquid biochemical hormonal lines of relation, attachment, and caregiving. Spella Petrich uh, is a major figure in uh, art science and bio art circles. Uh, her works have been shown uh, throughout everywhere in Europe, I think in, in this uh, area from Art Laboratory Berlin, where we had the joy of, of curating a solo show of her work in 2018, Ars Electronica, the Venice Biennale of Architecture, Pixel Point, European Conference on uh, Artificial Life, and I could go on and on. So it's our, uh, our pleasure to introduce Stella Petrich. Hey, uh, Chris, thank you very much for your generous uh, introduction. Um, and I'm uh, very happy uh, to be part of this panel. Uh, so it's actually um, the second time that I'm going to present the work Phytoteratology uh, at one of your uh, symposia. So the last one on human agents, I really delved into this relationship between the epistemological framing of this biotechnological creature. So instead uh, today, um, I decided to wear uh, another hat and delve into more of this molecularity. Um, yeah, taking the perspective of what science tells us um, as if it was kind of um, the reality, okay? So I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so uh, Physioteratology is about the creation of plant human monsters. And I've been interested in monsters uh, precisely because of their uh, ontological construction. They're figments of our imaginations, yet they always appear when there is a boundary that should not be trespassed. And interestingly enough, um, 
it was only the plant human monsters or anim plants with uh, animal capacities only appeared after Darwin drew a direct line from plants to humans in this evolutionary theory. And so even plants became threatening to us animals, right? Uh, so, but when thinking about how our uh, materiality, the bodies, our bodies are uh, done and uh, undone through this material exchange, um, I was looking at in which ways do we actually communicate with plants. And this communication is not only a matter of logic. Uh, underlying this is biosemiotics that are always material, right? So plant communication takes place in all these different intercellular, interorganismal, uh, ecosystemic levels, and it actually materially affects the plants themselves, all these microbes and ecosystems within which they dwell, but also ourselves. So the provocation here was to create a plant human monster uh, that would um, embody a boundary transgression and, and sort of try to think what it would look like. So actually way back, I started with another biosemiotic construction, which is Cotopoesis, uh, where I stood in front of Cress uh, for 20 hours to leave this imprint, right? And so the plants reacted to me uh, by changing the morphology of their bodies and this is another kind of biosemiotic process. Um, but actually, a lot of the toxicity and, and um, strange relations that appear uh, because of this, uh, um, well, non-natural environments are actually very much an evolutionary artifact or a property of evolution. So this depicts a river in uh, the States uh, where they found feminized fishes, right? So there was some endocrine disruption going on and um, they were following the source of this disruption. And it wasn't actually, it was human cause, but not in the sense that we would think. These fish were transformed by products of tree pulp. So they were making paper and they were just washing all this uh, pine pulp into the river. And then some of the plant products got biotransformed by the microbes into a potent chemical that disrupted the endocrine system of fish. And so this leads me to, to co contextualize uh, this communication as both disruptive as well as very much a property of living organisms. So here's a slide I really like to use. It's rabbits on a field of, of grass and if rabbits um, overpopulate uh, their pee actually is is well mess, um, clover receives uh, messages from their pee and starts synthesizing basically a contraceptive so the clover isn't overgrazed and we can see these kind of connections everywhere right in ancient greece uh, this plant the queen ends lace was or its relative uh, actually went ex extinct because women were using it uh, as an immunagogue, so to prevent unwanted um, uh, pregnancies. This is all because, not as an artifact of life, but because it was essential that actually living organisms are able to communicate and negotiate their presence amongst each other. So there has to be some sort of way of, of uh, yeah, this molecular crosstalk, right? And uh, we can see this in uh, act the, the chemistry of uh, these signaling molecules because they're essentially all related to each other, right? So uh, as, as this unifying theory of intercellular communication states, uh, the construction or the development, the evolution of these molecules predated the split before between animals and plants. And this is why we still have these effects. So for this phytotertology project, it was really interesting for me to find that mammalian sex hormones are produced by plants and they do actually also have a physiological role. 
So here we can see progesterone affecting the growth um, of the Arabidopsis thaliana, the tail crest that I also used uh, in this artwork, as well as testosterone uh, affecting the pollen tube growth, right? So it grows really long and really fast. Uh, and so this is the route I also chose for phytoterthology, the plant human monsters were actually bathed in a hormonal um, uh, bath or an extract of my hormones that I isolated from the urine. And uh, of course, the hormonal system uh, is very complicated in humans as well as elsewhere. And there are only a couple of um, hormones that can be found in urine and it's also a mixture that is completely uh, messy undefined but this extract is what went into uh, this uh, ectogenesis of the plant human monsters and so to conce conceive this phytopollutant uh, i started with actually plant stem cells that I got from an embryo. So here in this picture, we see sort of the development of a baby plant inside a seed. And uh, the last uh, picture on the uh, left, on the right corner, right lo lower corner is what was the beginning of the process. It was a very biochemical, very like scientifically, uh, scientific aesthetic <laughs> and protocol one. And so these are, uh, this is the first stage where the little embryos are exposed to really high and disruptive levels of um, a plant hormone um, that is an oxine. So this is different from mammalian hormones. This is really a plant-based hormone that is in high amounts used as a pesticide. But in these low amounts, it causes these embryos or the cells of these embryos to get a bit confused and they make a bunch of these stem cells, right? So these um, um, globules of cells are actually stem cells. And these stem cells sometimes um, grow into organs, like here we see shoots and we see little hairs, root hairs. But sometimes uh, a single cell uh, will sort of remember once you remove the hormones, will remember that it was in, on its way to become an embryo. So this is actually a picture uh, that was uh, donated to me by the um, uh, Silvius Institute in Leiden that taught me this technique. And here we can see this on the bottom, the yellow part, is this cluster of undifferentiated cells and all these uh, small strange shapes are baby plants in their torpedo stage. And this usually is kept inside the seed, whereas here we see it sort of exposed. So these baby plants, starting from single cells, uh, as a result of this biotech process, were then bathed uh, in the hormonal mix uh, that contained both my hormones as well as uh, other endocrine uh, disruptors, like toxicities. Uh, and so this whole mix of um, this bodily uh, fluids uh, was in their environment while uh, they grew, right? So I would like to conclude my presentation with this uh, quote from um, Cohen, uh, who wrote about monster theory, monsters are the thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. They ask us why we have created them. And uh, phytoterratology was precisely uh, done for this, to ask us, to ask me, why uh, this desire and how are we actually creating these monsters? Thank you very much. Uh... And uh, uh, it's really been a, a fascinating journey, I think, from uh, your talk three years ago, which was also on phytoterratology, to actually realizing it in the space. And in the last uh, five weeks, you know, caring for it. So it's actually been interesting to see how it's developed. And, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and uh, maybe we can go on, on later on with, with, with Mary and with... Uh, uh, Naya and Rose and Amanda uh, and uh, with Laura and to talk about some of the kind of uh, ideas of, of monsters but also about chemical communication and signaling and, and how also these are uh, 
maybe ways and the thought uh, of pathways that are not um, usually thought about when one talks about you know, changing or, or, or uh, adapting uh, uh, life you know, in biotechnology. We ask one question, maybe a little bit just on the process. How, what was the origin of the, actually coming up with this work? You said you were working with in Leiden with uh, uh, an institute. Mm -hmm. uh, the origin as in uh, the motivation. Motivation or, and maybe, yeah, motivation and a little bit of the research or, or practical side. Um, so I was, I was kind of uh, within this biotech discourse. Uh, and this was, I guess, it started in 2015, uh, the, the origin of this project. I thought that uh, way too much a focus was directed at um, genes, this kind of information, this deterministic sort of weird way of um, looking at a genealogy of life. And so I thought uh, that this um, gentle yet at the same time violent construction of uh, 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 the environment, you know, so radically influencing the development or the, just the being of bodies uh, was really appropriate. So actually I wanted uh, to um, have this biofeminist approach to this otherwise essential uh, genetic determinism. So that was one part. And um, the other one uh, was I, I really wanted to play with, with um, this... Um, Fetus, the, the concept of fetuses, the concept of somatic embryogenesis uh, when applied to plants, because this is something that in science is used as a term, right? Nobody bats an eye. And yet there's something so strange about considering plants as having these uh, properties, or at least uh, nominally so, right? We use the same terms as we would use for animals. So it was sort of, uh, for me, really a question, like what would happen if these two things were put together and how would this strange um, ectogenetic practice um, be perceived and how it would change me as well. It was very much a question uh, that I wanted to explore. Thank you, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, bringing this all back in at the end of the panel. Uh, next, I want to go to Mary Magic. And, okay, uh, Mary Magic is an artist and a biohacker working at the intersection of biotechnology and cultural discourse. Their work spans documentary filmmaking, DIY science, and public intervention. They have a BSA in biological sciences and art at from Carnegie Mellon University and a master's in media arts and sciences from MIT Media Lab. Uh, their work often focuses on the presence and effect of endocrine disruptors in water, not just estrogen from birth control pills, but many pesticides and other chemicals produce estrogen-like chemicals, xenoestrogens, that flow into wetlands and infiltrate drinking water. Magic's work also questions our cultural notions of gender conform conformity uh, at a time when our industrial drainage has changed the environmental environment chemically and hormonally for over a century. They've generated DIY protocols for the extraction and detection of estrogen hormones from bodies and environments, reflecting microperformability and the potential for sex and gender hacking. Their recent work, Milik Bersama Recombinon, Combinant Commons, which was, is in the Camille Diaries exhibition, was produced during a 10-month research stay in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, and explores the implications of a heavily polluted urban river upon the human and more than human inhabitants that live along and within it. But of special interest to magic is the molecular permeability of both water and flesh and the post-industrial implications thereof. While we are all somehow aware of the interactions of plastics, pesticides, and industrial pollution with our bodies, the pull of everyday denial is strong. Mary Magic's practice is, is very much in the vein of Haraway staying with the trouble, working with and through a world of molecular queering. So I'm very happy to introduce Mary and, um, and give over the, uh, uh, the spotlight to her. Thanks, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. So uh, my name is Mary Magic. I'm originally from Los Angeles, but now I'm based in Vienna. 
I'm now going to share my slides and just begin the presentation. So um, I started kind of like a research project that I'm loosely calling river gynecology. And the whole idea is just taking this body of research that I've already done on um, endocrine disruption, environmental toxicity, uh, molecular colonization, and um, just apply it to a very um, site-specific, context-specific um, uh, research idea. So um, I was really lucky to get a research grant to spend 10 months in Jogja, Indonesia. And Jogja is, uh, it's considered one of the education and cultural capitals of Indonesia, and it's located in central Java. And I was there last year with my partner and child, and I was really lucky to collaborate with an art collective called Life Patch. And they've already started this um, Jogja River project since, uh, Wow, since 2012. And so they have a different uh, web page for each year that they're working on the project. But this is a snapshot of the project in 2016. And this is when they were doing a lot of river mapping. Um, just to give a little bit of context. Uh, so this river is not called Jogja River, but it's called Kali Chode, which is uh, Jogja. And What's interesting about this river is that um, it actually cuts the city in half as it goes from um, the north to the south. And at the north, you have this mountain, which is actually a, a, a volcano that erupts every 10 years. And then at the bottom, the river, it connects to another river that goes directly into the South Sea, so the ocean. So um, Life Patch, over the, the span of many years, did a lot of river mapping. They identified all these spots uh, along the river that uh, where they could um, basically do some 360 photography and kind of map the changes of the river as you go from the north to the south. The whole idea of the project actually was how can, how can we encourage citizens to monitor the health of the river? as if it were the health of their own bodies. Uh, this for me was really much, really very much in line with the, the concept of river gynecology because the whole idea is that the river is a part of your body and how do we diagnose the river as if we were diagnosing our own bodies for any kinds of toxicities or endocrine disruptors. Because what we see currently is just, uh, we have a huge microplastic problem um, we, especially in Southeast Asia, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of plastic going into the ocean. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. So this is a graph of the export import of plastic waste in 2015. And you can see like a lot of it went to China. And then in 2018, 2019, uh, China just basically said no more import of plastic waste and so the result is that a lot of the plastic waste went to other nearby southeast asian countries that are of lower economic wealth and also don't have the the uh, facilities and capacities to handle that much waste so uh, a lot of the waste that comes from the global north ends up you know, in the, in the global south and into the environments surrounding the global south. Uh, because what happens is when you don't have the capacity to handle all of this waste, it ends up going into the environment. Um, I also want to point out that uh, not all pollution and waste is colonial. This is from a website, Discard Studies, and uh, which is actually a very, very useful a resource um, if you're into feminist STS topics and pollution. So the whole idea is that, you know, lots of people, lots of uh, populations or communities that are indigenous and settle on indigenous lands, they do have the right to uh, develop that land. And so what might look like um, colonial waste to us might not be for them. So that's another 
kind of interesting perspective to keep in mind. So uh, this is a kind of image of the river during the summertime, which is the dry season in Jogja. And when it's, when it's the dry season, the water level is actually super low and uh, lots of kids just go out and play. And uh, when we interviewed and asked them uh, if they're afraid of all the trash in the river, most of them will answer, no, I'm not afraid of the trash. We're more afraid of the water snakes. So this kind of gave me an idea that um, a scene like this, like a river filled with trash is actually quite normalized for the young generation. So I spent um, like the first couple months of the residency just doing a lot of like exploration and trying to understand like how these river communities are constructed along the river and what level of intimacy do these people live with this, this polluted water. And then um, what's interesting is that there was um, previous work done by a priest and an architect called Romo Manun who decided to um, change the orientation of the houses where their backyard would no longer face the river, but the front of their house would face the river. And this really created um, a new spatial relationship of the community to the river because it's no longer the backyard where you throw away your trash, but you know, it's, it's front, your, your house is front facing to the river. And so you're more engaged with it. And you can also watch out if uh, neighbors in front of you are throwing trash into the river. So this was, a, this was kind of an initiative to, to get people more aware of the, the amount of pollution in the river. But unfortunately, what happened is that it increased the amount of uh, people settling along the riverbanks. So what, what happened was that um, these houses got like closer and closer and closer into um, the riverbank. And so there's a lot of crowding and there's a lot more, uh, I guess, like interchange between like that polluted water and these households. So um, this was really like the river is so it's like the river is very, very long. Um, it's maybe five kilometers of it will will run through the city will actually be like very urbanized. So uh, we did try to focus on one specific kampung and kampung is like uh, a section. It's like a neighborhood section. <laughs> I would describe it as there's not really an English translation for a kampung, but uh, what's really interesting is that a kampung is like a very, um, very dense network uh, where everything is in a way like self-governing, like uh, especially the women. The women do almost everything. Like if uh, if a child is born, if someone dies, like they handle the funeral. If you know they 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 provide the the food for everyone and and cooking and cleaning. So I felt like uh, the, it's the women who live much more intimately with the river, like the most most intimately with the river. Um, and of course, I'm I was thinking a lot about hydrofeminism as a possible feminist strategy for thinking through these kinds of issues and understanding the in interconnectedness of our bodies uh, with the water watery environments out there. Um, the question for me was, um, uh, do these types of feminisms uh, serve uh, people who are outside of the art world or outside of the academic world? Like, do these kinds of feminist thinkings actually serve uh, people who live with toxicities every single day and live in this watery embrace. So one of the people that I interviewed who I developed, uh, that my child Lola developed a relationship with um, was this man here. He was actually a village shaman and he reports seeing um, spirits actually like traveling along the river. And what's interesting is that, um, so the, the queen of the South Sea, who's depicted in this picture on, on the right, the queen of the South Sea, you know, there's been reports of her, of people seeing her actually going along the river and she's traveling from the spiritual kingdom of the South Sea and traveling to the, the spiritual kingdom in the north, which is the mountain Merapi, the volcano. And uh, so this shaman that I interviewed uh, he said, yeah, I've, I've seen her. I've also uh, talked to many different spirits that live along the river. 
um, various uh, species of fish and also like these serpent creatures with like the the with human head like just um, really really interesting um, Javanese mythical figures that that travel along the river and so in my interviews with with the river community with the people of, of the river communities I was trying to understand not only what are the causes of the river pollution because you know we know it's not only like this uh import export of plastic trade but it's also that you know not waste not all waste is colonial and what i found out was that they don't see the river as a living entity with agency but they see it as a highway for spiritual entities to cross and to traverse so I thought this was really interesting. And so this is the result of all of these, like all, of all of the research that I gathered. And um, this is the piece um, making its debut at Georgia National Museum last, last summer. And now it's in Art Lab Troy Berlin. And um, I'm out of time, so I don't know if it's worth it to describe the piece because it's already in the exhibition, but I was also working with these bioremediating fungi, and that's what you see in um, in the river installation, the the bamboo river installation, and then you also can see that over time the agar it does uh, if it does like evaporate and it gets really nasty. It also um, invites a lot of microbial contamination and I want to have this juxtaposition of contamination versus the sterility of the fungal plates. And that was also based on previous fungi research. And lastly, you have this mandala, this rotating mandala of the trash that I collected. And for me, this symbolized the kind of constant recombination of all of this uh, kind of plastic consumerism uh, culture that we have and the fact that it does break down in our, inside of our bodies, it creates new combinations and that we're just constantly glitching organisms, constantly making new combinations. So, and here it is. Um, you can see that the latex, which is those two sculptures that are on the sides, um, they have a lot of discoloration. So now it looks a bit more like resin. But um, I was really happy with this installation because for the first time I have them actually suspended. So they're kind of hanging more like fabric. So I kind of like that too. But the idea is that um, I wanted to have uh, these scenes that I saw along the river watched from an aerial view, I wanted to have that water replaced with something skin-like. So that's why I decided on latex. So that's all the trash from Indonesia and now it's in Berlin. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I, there's so much uh, we bring up, but maybe we'll bring it up in the general discussion. You know, I was thinking of composting culture and um, which Indonesia probably has been for thousands of years and before the introduction of plastics, which has kind of destroyed the whole logic of it. And, uh, you know, and also talking about, you know, kampungs, you know, because a similar German word from a similar time in German urban culture called Keats. Um, we're going to go on now to uh, Laura Benitez Valero. Uh, Laura has a PhD in philosophy and she's an independent researcher whose research connects philosophy, art, and technoscience. Her current research focuses on bioart, biohacking, processes of bioresistance, bio-civil disobedience, and non-human agents. She's a lecturer in critical and cultural studies at Masana Art and Design Center and an external lecturer in technology at Elisava Barcelona School of Design and Engineering. She's a guest researcher at Ars Electronica uh, Center and Makba Documentation Center, and she's been invited as a visiting lecturer and guest researcher at different institutions, uh, such as the Interface Cultural 
uh, Kunstuniversität in Linz, Sonar Festival in Hong Kong, Royal Academy of Arts in London, and the University of Puerto Rico. She's currently the director uh, of Biofriction out of Hangar in Barcelona. Uh, we have a great honor and joy of hearing Laura talk about biosophy and mutagenesis towards an alien symposis in our 2017 conference, Non-Human Agents in Art, Culture, and Theory. Today, Laura is going to, will talk about trans-hack feminist practices and how they can challenge responsibility as collective agents capable of making transitions between multiple levels of political, material, and conceptual organization repoliticizing feminism through biopractice. Thank you so much, Chris, for your generous introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen because I want to share with you some slides. So uh, as I said, hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. And of course, thanks to the organizers. I, I apologize for missing your previous presentations. And unfortunately, it's very likely that I will also miss this afternoon's presentations and I wanted to share with you very briefly why. So the situation over the last few weeks has been very complicated here in Barcelona at the art school where I'm teaching, La Masana. We have recently been informed that we are going to suffer some financial cuts. So uh, that this and that this cuts affect your staff. So we are supposed to start classes on Monday, but not only we don't have the slot allocations, uh, but between today and tomorrow, we can be informed that we are fired uh, during the weekend. Something that it's really, really cool. So faced with this situation of precariousness and vulnerability, we have been fighting all week <laughs> to ensure that the cuts are not made effective and that no one is going to be fired, organizing ourselves in assemblies, uh, lasting for more than eight hours every day until today. And as you can imagine, um, being fired um, two days before the start of the course and in the middle of a pandemic is an extremely stressful situation. So I don't think I'm in the best conditions for uh, to share a good talk today or to have a proper debate, but of course, I do my best. Perhaps um, some of you think that it's not appropriate to share this here today with you, but while we are making explicit reference to Donna Haraway, to situated epistemologies and to situated knowledge as well, I think that sharing the material conditions in which we are immersed is a political act because the structural violence affects us and has effects on what we do and how we do it. And it's precisely because of uh, the material dimensions of Haraway's uh, philosophical thought that I couldn't stop sharing uh, this with you, not sharing uh, this. It would have been to reduce Haraway's proposal to a conceptual uh, abstraction and uh, honestly, I, I don't want to do it. So my proposal today is to explain briefly why trans feminist practices and their weight inheritance uh, are a disruptive place from which to rethink in affirmative uh, terms, not only the thick now, but uh, the untimely potential of the contemporary. In this context then, trans feminist trans feminism, sorry, are a counter proposal to technocratic solutions and their uh, masculinist epistemologies. What, um, so uh, in this context, uh, I'm referring to trans feminism as a repoliticization of feminism through biopractices as a multiplicity of methods and this proposal it has its origins in the trans hack feminist manifesto by pech blender and in general terms um, trans hack feminism referred to hacking with care uh, using hacking in a meaning of uh, active resistance and transformations in a way to to generate 
transversal knowledge, transversal and critical tools through transdisciplinary artistic, aesthetic or cultural proposals. So um, also Transact Feminism is working on human and non-human alliances and solidarity through, for example, do it together biochemistry. And I think that one of the most important things here in this context of this symposium and also the exhibition at the Art Laboratory Berlin is uh, the conception of trans feminism as a way to stay in touch with the material affective dimensions of doing and engaging bio practices. So with regards to the last questions, I think that uh, it's important to, po to point out that um, both in the proposal of the symposium, the exhibition, and also the trans trans feminist practices themselves. And quoting Haraway, of course, biology is not only understood as the naturalist science that study life and living organisms, but biology is a discourse, not the living world itself. So human are not the only actors and agents in the construction of the entities of any scientific discourse. Machines and other partners are active constructors um, of natural scientific uh, objects. So like other scientific bodies, organisms are not ideological constructions. So always radically, historically specific, always lively bodies have a different kind of a specific um, and a specificity, sorry, and effectivity. And so they invite a different kind of engagement and interactions as well. They invite to generate worlds and by providing a tool through which to refer to human and non-human entanglements. If we were in mind the transhumanist proposals of the body in transition, perhaps, um, then it's worth asking whether technocratic, techno-fantastic proposals beyond the fascination produced by technological hyper-sophistication is contemporary or merely celebratory technophilia that only sees the light of a future. So in the course of theoretical philosophy, uh, Giorgio Agamben asked, who and what are we contemporary of? And what does it mean to be contemporary? These are questions that are entirely appropriate for us in the attempt to analyze what is at stake at the intersections between bioinfotechnologies, biochemistry, bodies, artistic practices, subjectivities, and power relations. So, reappropriating Nietzsche's a uh, well-known quote, the contemporary is the untimely, Agamben articulates a uh, critique around the lights and leftovers of what we call present. And like the transhumanist proposals of the body as an autonomous agent edited and implemented, we find proposals that not only perceive the lights of a possible future, but are capable of perceiving the shadows of and darkness of the present. A dark human, modern, Western, colonial, and anthropocentric condition then in turn allows the light of other possible articulations to be glimpsed, or what we call in terms of Agamben contemporary practices. So Nietzsche in his untimely meditations um, ask how, um, how to use knowledge for life, uh, for action? What is our vital relationship to the historical past, to inheritance? So these questions I think that are fundamental in a context where the relationship between life and knowledge uh, are inverse, seen as Braidotti points out, uh, contemporary capitalism has a biogenetic structure and life is understood as an information system. So it is precisely on how to use again knowledge for life and combat conceptions of it as a mere resource for the production of value that leads us to trans feminism. Practices or proposals such as uh, Chimera Rosa, Mary Magic, Espela Petrick, Pech Blenda, Ryan Hammond, among others, are using and producing knowledge for life, 
for action while at the same time making a critical review of our vital relationship with the historical past, with inheritance, in what we are concerned with here, the quantification of life from bio, biometricians to Galton est statistics, even to um, biochemistry determinism as well, and as well as its subsequent, um, let's say, biological reductionism to try to justify and legitimate a supposed natural order of things. So as Agamben puts it, contemporaneity can only be revealed in the density of intertwined temporalities, in the disjunction of anachronisms from which our present moment is perceived. An inheritance, all these practices uh, critically rethink the notion um, or on inheritance, sorry, um, all these practices um, critically rethink the notion of human inherited from modernity, resetting both its colonial and uh, speciesist articulation as well. So in these trans feminist practices, therefore something similar to what Foucault pointed out in the order of things occurs, that is, a radicalization of the processes of constitution with the particularity that the body is not understood here as an, uh, as an autonomous agent, but rather as a note of entangled in an extensive system of relationships and also of fluidities. A place of extended uh, anomalous resignification in a network of bodies and fluidities, not only the human wants, um, not only the human wants, um, where the, constitu the constitu constituent power is the organizational dynamic of the multitude. It's becoming a constituent becoming. So while the Transhumanist trans uh, drift of the body in transit, we find technocentric exaltation that not only perpetuates transcendent uh, political apparatuses, but masks a quantification of life in terms of improvement and moral duty. What we call, what we could name or, or the so called uh, trans hack feminist practices uh, or the mainly the trans hack feminist and timely bodies is present to us as an experience of estrangement. It alerts us through the commitment to generate share and situated knowledge to the relations between knowledge and power and, and well, as to the importance of articulating open processes to bioinfotechnologies uh, bio and, and biochemistry. This allows us to confront the trans, um, the trans um, human, the transhumanist um, aspirations to normalize um, a social body, not only through language, but also through the promises of future, through discourses based on a specific knowledge, the discourse of improvement articulated from the eugenic heritage where the normal exercise power over the so-called abnormal. So trans hack feminist practices, uh, on the other hand, are the revolt of anomalous bodies and fluidities where poiesis or constitution is not understood as individuality, um, but as, as sympoiesis, as a constant process of materialization. A multitude that is not so much post-humanist but uh, post-exceptionalist, where resistance shapes lives, assuming the terrain of the common as singularities, terrain where the human conditions, as we have understood it, is being erased like a face drowned on the shore, a terrain of contemporaneity, or the articulation of the terrains of this thick now. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, 
Wow, that's, that's really quite amazing. Uh, it, it puts a really nice kind of framework with the last, with, with uh, Mary and Spella, but on, 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 uh, on a more abstract level. And uh, you know, at the same time, bringing it back down to uh, your situation right now. Um, and uh, what's really interesting here is thinking about this community-based knowledge. And maybe that's something we talk about later with, with Mary, uh, who, you know, after 10 months in, in Jokja, where I think uh, there are, are, you know, are, are certain par fascinating parallels, which, uh, you know, there has been this give and take also between uh, some of the artists from, uh, that you've worked with in Barcelona and uh, Job Jakarta. Um, and so, um, what, uh, what I was wondering was, uh, I think, uh, you were talking about resistance shapes life in new worldings, and uh, uh, how do we make a space for that exactly in this time when where uh, our movement is limited, our option, you know, and uh, you know, on one hand, there's this um, uh, health disaster, and on the other hand, uh, it's something that power uses into uh, to limit our uh, uh, yeah, expression as well. And there's a kind of this careful balance between, uh, 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 you know, preserving ourselves and, and not uh, at the same time, not uh, giving up uh, the space we, spaces we have, but doing that responsibly. So it's even a more complicated uh, form. Hmm. Well, I think that probably, I mean, is I think that it's a, it's a key question. And, and to be honest, I don't have the answer. But I think that one of the main aspects regarding this question is uh, for sure to be concerned of the difference between uh, social distancing and physical distance. And uh, at the same time to, I I'm going to say take the opportunity, okay? But uh, at least to try to rearticulate cares through this situation because uh, of course there's such a you know biopolitical necropolitical thanatopolitical things going on right now in, in this pandemic and beyond this pandemic it depends in on, on world areas <laughs> as we all know but uh, the thing is that in a way, I think that uh, probably the, the crucial point is something that there was uh, in one of uh, my slides. It's a difference uh, between working within uh, power in terms of potestas or in terms of potential. And there is always this, uh, let's say, tricky, tricky mm -hmm. game, tricky practice. And I think that precisely this kind of practices, uh, transhack feminism, some of the artistic practices that already are exhibited at the Art Laboratory Berlin or the practices that we are referring to during this symposium, precisely because of the ways that um, in which uh, or through which they are articulating and generating situated knowledges they are giving us tools in order to rethink and to rearticulate care within this situation. But it's a super general answer, but uh, it's the only one that I have right now. Okay, thanks. I, we can also come back to this uh, on different levels in the general discussion. Next, I want to introduce uh, three artists who work together to create the, the work Mamalga in the exhibition. So that's uh, Naya Ankerfeld, uh, who researches how life abounds with similar forms found in different species or in different scales. Naya has an enduring interest in these resonances and the connections they reveal. Resonances between brain and gut, skin and grass, rock and cell wall. Drawing attention to our intimacy with other species and spaces by inviting us into a strange kind of mediated uh, intimacy uh, with her body. And Bauman Leahy, uh, they uh, are a, an earth-based semiotic practice exploring how sustainable futures can be grown between environmental ethics and multi-species aesthetics. With a multimodal approach, they translate intangible phenomena 
and complex uh, ecological dynamics into sensorial experiences whilst collaborating with experts across disciplines from microbiologists to quantum computer scientists, architects to cosmologists. So uh, we have Amanda Baum, Rose Leahy, Naya Ankerfeld, who will be the next panel. Uh, it will be a, uh, a panel, uh, they will speak together uh, and um, on uh, their work with Malga, but also on the idea of working on algae uh, as a, a kind of a making kin with uh, algae, algae with its role uh, as a kind of a primordial uh, ancestor, uh, primordial relative, I should say, and uh, um, as they note in their work, uh, that the, uh, the first sexual being was uh, 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 algal, was a red algae, and the work Lamalga uh, is a uh, work experimental gathering, worshiping the remediating abilities of algae in ways of mothering or making kin in algal family patterns. So I give the uh, space over to Amanda and to Rose and to Naya. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, for inviting us to be part of the Camille Diaries exhibition and symposium. It's been really uh, exciting for us and um, I'd like to just share. Okay, so um, the three of us created uh, this piece, Mamalga, together two years ago after years of being collectively enamored and uh, working with LD in various forms. Um, in Mamalga, you are invited to actively become one with your elder kin through a ritual reciting of what we call the mantra Mamalga and a consumption of red LD. Um, with it, amongst other things, we ask uh, which kinds of collective practices should be fostered as we move into systems of accelerated scientific quantification and biological technology opportunities. How can we nurture deep emotional connections to other organisms as our kin and ancestors and shape hybrid sustainable systems through this awareness? So taking part in Mamelga, this slow immersive experience allows a dissolving of boundaries between spaces and species as your body merges with the red LV. In materializing the relationship of algal human biology, our hope is that Mamelga conveys mammalian memories whilst pointing to possible futures of uh, multi-species cohabitation and celebration. So in the version um, of Mamelga that we evolved for the Camille Diaries exhibition at Art Laboratory Berlin, we integrated red macro algae harvested by the company Dance Tank, the seaweed in Altel, Denmark, uh, where I live, both as a sculptural element and in small agar cups uh, made from this fresh red algae called Gracilaya. So Gracilaya is an invasive species which decreases the biodiversity of the marine ecosystem. And so by harvesting it, we help uh, regenerate the ecosystemic balance. Um, and so that way, Mamelga is an example of our aim to foster symbiosis between active environmental impact uh, and meaningful aesthetic experience. And Rose will expand uh, a bit further on the practice of dance time and their connection uh, to the theme of the exhibition later in this talk. Yes. This is also from Art Laboratory Berlin. Um, the ceremonial gathering, we think, resonates with the words of Astrid Maimanis, who speaks of our common history in the watery beginnings or a deep time hydro commons. Um, Mamelga pays homage and offers a bodily mammal elga transubstantiation into this realization of ourselves as bodies of water and uh, in Maimani's words to understanding ourselves as existing through time. So in Mamelga as in other ceremonial gatherings within our practice we aim to create these moments of remembering our primordial origins um, and to consciously embody the, the modern human. So the ceremony is specifically inspired by Lynn Margulis' theory of symbiogenesis in which prokaryotic life was engulfed in a cell and through this 
uh, symbiotic merging became the eukaryotic cells that we and all other multicellular members um, are made up of. So this was the first version of uh, Mamelga that we did it as part of the SLA Green Conference and at uh, the National G Gallery of Denmark and Copenhagen University. Um, and in the, the piece, we, we kind of staged this meeting between the voluntary bodies and externalize and exaggerate the biological, scaling it up to a mammalian experience of cheering together, looking each other in the eyes and collectively reading out this mantra, Manoga. And in this collective act, action, we invite in an honesty and a vulnerability towards uh, this impossible longing to be and feel amalgam at once, meridian and organ. Referring back to Naimani's words, in this openness, we hope to relate to how we have all um, become liquid hot mess uh, in the suffering across marine and mammalian bodies. And so in response, Mamalga is a form of social prayer and an ode to making kin across bodies and time, suggesting how especially now in a time of struggles, uh, ritual gatherings can echo through our own and each other's internal waters and help us remember and start to regenerate our shared hydrophilic um, livelihood. And then I will speak a bit more of the LD. So the work is originally inspired by the luscious rouge bouquets and filamentary structures of micro algae found in the plantation of the deep sea, as well as the dramatic red tides of micro algae blooming in marine environments. Throughout the process, we wanted to experiment with different materials, textures, and techniques in shaping and crafting the work and to show a red nature. We wanted to draw parallels of soft wet bodily organs and playing with the different association of colors. Um, so the project is offering um, complementary uh, complementary view to the wave of greenness um, of nature and the blueness of ocean, and so on. And um, when we started to research uh, red algae, we realized that they come in so many different colors and, and, so, and so many red, different red shades. Um, so we have uh, seen and tasted neon, neon orange pigment powder, and pink and violet, and also a lot of different green dark colors that are red algae. And of course, um, this primary bright red color um, that is also associated with the project now. Articulating both the soft, sensual and visual color connection between human and algal bodies, we wanted to explore the evolutionary connection between ocean and human and to show red algae as ancestors and other species mothers. So, we found out that if mothering slash othering implies creating conditions for life to involve, then algae have been mothering slash othering um, humans for billions of years. And uh, throughout the evolution of different species of red algae, there's been uh, creating conditions for biodiversity to flourish, including human life. Um, and that is because the, the human body has an ancient entanglement with a certain kind of red algae, which is called Bengiomorpha pubescens. And that one is the first known sexually reproducing organism, as well as the origin of you karyotic cells, and thus it can be seen as the evolutionary mother of all earthy mammals. Um, and the branching skeletons of the red algae, uh, we see as um, a, like some parallel connection to the human wings and, and uh, 
yeah, we just thought it was really interesting to explore this entanglement of life and death of, of our human memory and nature. Um, and um, yeah, together with the oldest living organ multicellular organisms. Moreover, the connection between human bodies and red algae is shown in nutritious relationship between human and ocean lives. So for millennia, red algae has been used as medical remedies and as sources of food, such as edible dolls. Um, it's also called Palmaria palmata. And of course, the red marine algae, which is so um, vital and really helps our immune system in very light min min minute quantities. Um, it has like the right composition of vitamins and antioxidants that the, body, the human body can utilize. And then of course, other microalgae um, species will be extremely difficult for human and, and other mammal bodies. So yeah, um, the red nature of Mamoga invites us to wonder about and imagine possible multi-species futures of cohabitation. And now we hear Rose part. Thanks. So as well as the life remedying eating abilities of the algae, We've also been finding inspiration in ways of mothering or making kin in algal family patterns. So red algae are a family of diverse and relating organisms made up of 7,000 species estimated. Um, and they're a polyphyletic group, uh, which derives from the ancient Greek polyphily, polis meaning many and phulon species, which is at its core a multi-species concept. They're descended from multiple ancestral sources without sharing a common ancestor or lineage. And so they instead share characteristics in addition to their differences. And that's what results in their grouping as kin. As a group defined by both similarity and difference, the polyphyletic algae family are exemplars of how we can think through queer kinship and multi-species mothering. This polyphyletic grouping resonates with Harawayan kinship, to quote, not necessarily to be biologically related, but in some way to belong in the same category with each other in such a way that has consequence. And so inspired by this, Mamalga takes this idea of multi-species groupings and merges mammal and alga into Mamalga, a hybrid osmosing entity. The polyphyletic kin kinship and mothering of human and algae takes place through the mythology of Mamalga and in the ritual transubstantiation of the algae, um, but also in the very real material storytelling of where, from where and by whom the seaweed is sourced. Um, it's from a company called Dankstang, uh, local to where Amanda lives, as she mentioned earlier. And it's a fun family run business by Klaus Markusen and his son, Simon. And they have always lived in consequence and relation to the seaweed of the local area. They sustainably harvest the local seaweed and then distribute it to restaurants, creating many mini acts of mammalgan transubstantiation all over Denmark. And they educate people about macroalgae during seaweed safaris, facilitating encounters between mammal and algae Dang's Tang also gets entangled in the patterns of algal family living and dying by harvesting and making use of invasive species such as Gracilaria, as Amanda also mentioned before. So to quote Haraway again, the need for care across generations is urgent and it cannot just be a humanist affair. Klaus and Simon, like Camille and the monarch and the seaweed, have paired with and cared for the generations of local seaweed throughout their lifetime. And these macroalgae have in turn cleansed the atmospheric conditions of the local area. 
feeding and releasing oxygen, which is then breathed in and out by humans and, sorry, just in by humans and non-humans alike. Finally, Dang Tang's educational practice inspires a different care towards the algae from those that are visiting and attending these uh, educational classes. And so through this, Klaus and Simon perform multiple acts of mothering and kinning with the algae of Olsera. Their mammalgan constellation are an example of a kinship network that has consequence, both mammal and algae sustaining one another, along with countless other local agents. And so Mamalga traverse, traverses worlds of kinship, both mythological and present, and through both polyphyletic groupings, local multi-species kinships, and ritual transubstantiations in the gallery. We explore the multi-directional modes for care in mammal and algal communities, and the unexpected and multiple sources, sources that these emerge from. So now we would like to end by reading out uh, a part of the Man from Anoga, which we collectively wrote together, uh, the three of us. We'll start. Here we drink from primordial genesis with origins in slime. Our branching blood morphology brings hydrophilic memories of cellular ancestors. Forever algal, the red nature of mamalga. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful uh, final talk to the panel. And maybe I'll start off with some notes and questions. Uh, Astrida uh, Naimanis was really interested in, in the work earlier, and she made this uh, reference to the ritual. And she, for her, it brought out uh, all these ideas of, of witchcraft. Of you know of this other kind of side of uh, as a kind of uh, opposing side for science or maybe not sorry but or an optional side uh, but at the time I thought of the Eleusinian mysteries these kind of mysteries that Athens had uh, which were uh, connected with at that time with the agrarian culture of uh, uh, of Athens. But there is also, you know, certainly the uh, oceanic, the sea, the marine side to it. And it's interesting that in your work, you have this uh, connection also to uh, algae as something that can be eaten. The sea can give not just fish or seafood, but can give, uh, uh, you know, uh, algal uh, sustenance, uh, which is interesting. Um, also, maybe something we could tie in a little bit with, uh, with Mary's talk on Jogja, because I know that Indonesia as an archipelago is obviously a wonderful place for algae. And uh, uh, I was going to say with Mary that Indonesian cultures uh, for your millennia have been composting cultures. It's the tropics, you throw out your garbage and it enriches your garden. You literally uh, uh, kind of, you know, it's a, it's a circular cycle. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, when plastics were introduced to that, it was disastrous and is today disastrous. But uh, one of the more interesting uh, projects to make a, a bioplastic, uh, a biodegradable plastic, it comes from algae. And I, I know it's just really in the beginning stages, but actually I think supposedly algal bioplastics are the most likely to produce a replacement for the, you know, the bag you get at the grocery store. So... Uh, it's maybe an interesting, uh, you know, kind of connection there. The the idea of uh, of creating uh, or reinventing or rediscovering uh, age-old alliances, but also uh, patterns of of human sustenance uh, that are existed thousands of years ago have been in some cases forgotten in the modern era are being rediscovered, and uh, the potential they might have to. Um, countering uh, the destruction of the industrial area on uh, our uh, environments and on our, our own bodies. Um, I'm sorry, Chris, was that a question directed to Yeah, yeah it was a kind of a okay. question about the different the ideas of, uh, of the composting culture versus the 
the, the plastics, but also the idea of algae uh, uh, as an uh, alternative to it or other forms, uh, you know, kind of going back natural forms that could uh, work as, op as alternatives to the destructive uh, list of, of plastics, of pesticides, of, uh, you know, so you could say uh, uh, different forms of, of uh, remediation. Yeah, certainly um, with uh, the collective research that we did on the fungal bioremediation, we were actually uh, working with two species, uh, first with uh, schizophyllum and the other one with um, with oyster mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the one that we have now in the exhibition, right, at Berlin. But um, we were, I was definitely really interested in how um, the residues of our industrial capitalism could be transformed um, through organisms that have uh, been able to find adaptations to this newly uh, molecular colonized world that we're living in. And um, we were also really interested in what kinds of new relationships could be made with this fungal species. So we saw research where there's also like anti-cancer properties, uh, anti-thrombosis properties. We um, were hacking the mushroom to try to make uh, cheese or tea, or we're trying to cultivate it in our own urine. We tried to cultivate it in coconut water. So um, really there's so, um, it's, it's really interesting to explore um, the different entanglements uh, that we can have with, uh, with other organisms that are already so um, interconnected with the, so porous with the environment. Um, in terms of bioplastic substitutes, uh, there's actually a, an, an initiative right now in coming out of Bali in Indonesia where they're making plastic bags out of cassava. So um, that's a very, very new, uh, I guess they're like a startup company now. But um, I feel like Indonesia, the country itself is super aware of this plastic issue. Um, it's when they when they saw my my piece and my research, they're also a bit, little bit like, oh, we see so many plastic projects already. You know, every a lot of artists are making works about plastic, but yet we're still in this predicament. So um, yeah, I think it's it's really interesting um, to look at this plastic phenomenon as kind of a hyper object where um, it's so imperceptible to us uh, as a human society because it's, it's so large in scale. But at the same time, we've, we're also so normalized to seeing this kind of destruction around us that it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> we've seen this already. We know there's a plastic problem. Uh, so it's this kind of, um, it's almost like a cognitive dissonance. Like this world is so alienated okay, but I don't really want to deal with it, you know, <laughs> so, um, so it's kind of interesting to, to encounter this kind of affect. Maybe uh, Amanda or Naya, with your practice in, uh, in Denmark on the coast, uh, what are uh, some of the uses and practices and, uh, uh, connected with algae that maybe offer you know, new uh, different options of, of ways of life or replacements or sustainable uh, materials, for instance. So what, as um, Rose described uh, in, in depth about um, the practice of this local company here called the Seaweed Dantzang, is very much focused on uh, harvesting the local species. The geography of this area is so that there are like lots of diverse marine ecosystems, so there is naturally many different kinds um, and they, they do it usually for selling us as food but more and more they are contacted by people like us, designers and artists and other creatives who are interested all, in all the amazing potentials there are for creating materials or using it um, as yeah to create uh, energy and so on. So, uh, they have a very pragmatic um, uh, approach to it, which we very much enjoy, but we also want to, to add this um, 
the experiential and the aesthetic to it that makes it more than just another commodity for industrial uh, applications, but has this whole history of our evolutionary kinship and, and all the incredible um, aspects of these organisms that are still live organisms and not just to be used as, as commodities. Um, so it's, it's quite incredible uh, to live in this kind of area where uh, it's very much based on sustainability and the trust that all these um, uh, opportunities, although the world is um, challenged, the, that it's forceful enough to, you know, to keep working uh, towards this goal of sustainable systems taking over. Okay, I see from Natasha we have a question for YouTube from Anami Mais for Spella, and she I was asking Spella to explain the link uh, and process between uh, uh, female urine hormones and the other, the plant embryos, the uh, uh, Arabidopsis. Okay, so um, full disclosure, there is actually not uh, super a lot of potent hormones in urine uh, because actually that's a major way that hormones are excreted after they're used and their concentrations are regulated. So normally um, you would have deactivation, like they, there's sugars attached and then you just uh, pee them out. Uh, what I did was actually, uh, I, I isolated all substances that uh, were structurally like hormones. And then um, I used a, an enzymatic process to reactivate them. Uh, and even so, there were just like about four uh, different hormones still left in that extract uh, at variable concentrations. And probably every time I took samples, they were different, right? So. These hormones were then basically placed inside the medium where the plants developed from a single cell onwards. So the way that um, they affected or not affected the plants uh, was not determined. I wasn't looking for a scientific uh, observation to be able to pinpoint exactly uh, how plants were changed by this because um, I've, uh, that part was done by scientists, right? So scientists have proven that plants express receptors for uh, these human steroid hormones and that they've also produced them and that they have some sort of effect. Whereas here, it was really about uh, taking this, let's call it one a molecular essence, which besides native hormones also includes all the toxicities and disruptors and caffeine and nicotine and I don't know, uh, traces of birth control pills, etc. right? And then uh, sort of having that part be the pel pellicula of the embryo's development. Uh, Laura, I think you, do, uh, you seem like you have a, an idea or a comment. Well, no, I, I really, I, I was, you know, fascinating listening to Spell explaining this <laughs> link. Uh, no, I, I was uh, thinking of this, uh, how, what's called uh, this uh, molecular essential or something like this you said Spella uh, it, it, it sounds pretty interesting to me precisely in terms of inheritance but at the same time uh, within uh, Spella's practice uh, hacking any conception of essentialism so uh, I was I was yeah paying attention to, to that particular <laughs> yeah 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 but uh, you're absolutely right because I kind of play with this right this hormonal essence right that you extract right which is the reduction but then uh, Lara it's also about uh, this perfume essence right 
which is precisely this super potent uh, little thing that also has a very particular sense of your body, of your uh, pheromones, right? And then you add that as if it is to substitute everything. So I think this is a concept that is very prevalent uh, in our societies and discourse, right? So here I, I use it uh, tongue in cheek, I would say, no? Yeah, I mean, totally. It's, it reminds me also what happens with spell, with spell and spell, no? As a witchcraft, so yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know also, I think, uh, I mean, kind of come full circle back to Spella's idea of, of actually trying to, um, well, I would say very much in your work, we have talked about dual epistemologies and dueling epistemologies. Uh, uh, between the, you see, often between theory and science, but also here um, between the idea of the liquid, of the biochemical, of the chemical signaling, of, uh, and this disruptive semiotics, uh, and the, um, the more mainstream biotechnological discourse of genetics, which, as I was saying, has this, uh, you know, it, it certainly has its legitimate side, but it, it also comes from this situated knowledge. Uh, uh, that's rooted in patrimony and property and in, in its expression in industry is very much about, you know, intellectual property and through gene editing and so on. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to also think about this, this way of um, non-genetic kin uh, that also we find in algae, uh, in algae morph morphologies uh, and in a way this is a um, you know, has an interesting disruptive factor while without, you know, uh, leaving the, the realm of actually, you know, talking about the science of the, uh, 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 of the organisms and the relations that go into it. And so even creating biotechnologies that are not about property is, is also an interesting um, possibility and potentiality. Then I want to thank you all for a really wonderful panel. Uh, and I think there's also a lot of ideas here that we'll bring into uh, the final discussions uh, and into the next panel as well, which also has uh, a partial connection to algae in it um, through corals. So thank you very much.